good afternoon and welcome to our show. Um, there is a product placement about to happen. Um, <laughs> thanks to David Letterman and Netflix. Uh, David Letterman has a great uh, show called My Next Guest Needs No Introduction. However, this guest, who's very special to me, is going to introduce himself because he has a little <laughs> ground to cover. And welcome, Rick Tallman. Thanks, Ricky. Uh, nice yeah, to be here. I'll let you introduce yourself. Oh, fair enough. Well, my name is Rick Tallman. Uh, I am a, a sustainability uh, professional. I've been spent most of my adult life working in sustainable industries, uh, everything from cleaning up big Superfund sites to starting new water utilities. Uh, uh, a lot done a lot of uh, renewable energy uh, projects and uh, brought a lot of new sustainable technologies uh, to the market. Uh, and I think for the Hawaii audience, uh, a lot of folks are uh, familiar with the company AES Clean Energy, who've done a lot of the renewable work on, uh, across the islands. Uh, that's a company that started uh, as Main Street Power, a company I started at the end of 2008. Uh, we sold our company to AES in 2015, and and they've taken it to the stratosphere from them. Uh, I couldn't be happier with the quality of work or 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 the uh, direction the company's going. Uh, so my wife and I live full time on Kauai right now, and I'm uh, working to help uh, 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 investors and uh, operating companies, uh, uh, you know, get uh, more dollars and more effort towards our clean energy uh, transition. One of the things that I liked about Rick is early on, he uh, he's a good teacher. And uh, we went back and forth about clean energy. We started very small from houses, jumped to electronic vehicles. Um, the last show that I did uh, was heavy in EVs. He listened to it. Uh, thanks to Luke, um, I changed my mind. And then uh, when I recapped that uh, with Rick, he tried to change my mind even further. So I'm, I'm fully prepared. <laughs> Uh, to give them the floor uh, about EVs, but also how everything fits together, all for a good cause of make me, making me wrong. So I turn it to you, Greg. <laughs> well, I never want to be in that position, Ricky, because my, from my experience, you don't stay wrong for very long. So uh, glad, glad to be part of the discussion today. I appreciate it. Um, well, I really think it's worth talking about more generally um, when we get into the conversation of EVs and whether it's time to start putting infrastructure in for those kind of things. Uh, where our conversation went and what I thought would be interesting to share today is just some discussion about the infrastructure in the state of Hawaii and, and specifically or here on Kauai where we live and uh, how the role of that infrastructure is going to be challenged and is going to grow over the next, say, 20 years. Uh, 20 years seems like a long time, but in the in infrastructure business, it's a, it's a blink of an eye. Uh, and uh, as everyone knows, especially here on Kauai, there's a reputation of, of dramatically shifting to renewable energy, which I think has been you know, seen as a great thing. Not only are, is the island about, I think, 70% renewable now, moving to close to 90% uh, once we get a couple more projects done. Um, uh, but it not only has it made uh, the power and the energy on the island uh, cleaner, it's also made it now the least expensive uh, power to buy in the state. Uh, and that's a direct uh, uh, impact from going renewable. So that progress continues to be made, and the state has set a goal, as we all know, of, of being 100% renewable on the grid uh, by 2045. Uh, the, the thing that I'm not sure everyone has completely grasped there is that by 2045, everything in our life will be running off the electric grid. Uh, elect EV car sales are, you know, skyrocketing. Uh, last month, for the first time, the Tesla Model Y was the uh, best-selling car model in the world. Uh, and that, as we like to say, the, the train has left the station and it's an electric train. Um, you know, there are a lot of good reasons we can talk about what's driving the energy transition. Uh, from my perspective, it's not people trying to save the world. It's actually uh, working families trying to save a lot of money. 
what you can do if we take fuel out of our lives and replace it with electricity. We get into that in a minute. Uh, but uh, what's happening that is going to really challenge our electric grid on each island over the next 20 years is, is really kind of a perfect storm. As we're ramping up and, and learning how to uh, run the grid, operate it, and keep it balanced, which is not a simple feat, uh, with renewable uh, and, uh, energy and, and battery storage, um, we're also going to see this flood of use. We're going to have to dramatically increase the capacity of our grid uh, because all of our truck cars and our trucks and our farm equipment, uh, uh, our water heaters, uh, everything from your you know, uh, diesel uh, dump truck to your iPhone is going to be uh, run with by electricity. So we're not just trying to get to 100% clean electricity by 2045 we're going to be getting everything in our lives renewable by 2045, whether we like it or not. Uh, and uh, and I think that's really important because the current state of the grid, it, it isn't designed to drastically increase the capacity, and we're going to have to. Um, it also isn't designed to withstand severe weather uh, uh, events. And with climate change, we all have are starting to experience those uh, those, client, those those severe weather events are going to happen more and more often, uh, or at least become more severe. Uh, and so uh, those two challenges of getting through the energy transition and getting a, a, a more uh, a robust, uh, re resilient uh, uh, energy source is all playing out on top of us going renewable. And so it's going to be very complex. And there are a lot of things that we could be doing right now that would make that a lot less expensive and a lot easier uh, than waiting until we have to react. Uh, so let me stop there. The Any thoughts on that, Ricky? Oh, no. I, 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 uh, since I'm wrong, I'm going to stick with being wrong about the EVs. Uh, now I can quote you instead of The Economist. Um, <laughs> the sidebar to this, that um, to the audience, why I came to appreciate you is – uh, about six, eight months ago, uh, we had the chance to go to the Wanya Power Plant, which is the oldest hydro project uh, west of the Rockies. And right. um, the genesis for, for that was A&B was putting on the market. But our particular relationship started when uh, you mentioned that you had a background in um, hydroelectric power, uh, helping small towns on the eastern slope of the Rockies. Um, upgrade their hydro facilities. And um, starting from that point, um, when we went up and walked through a very beautiful place with a very expert engineer, um, that was the first time I, I, I really appreciated uh, the importance of me not talking. <laughs> well, let's and, go and, with that. Let, let, me de let me dig in a little bit here. Um, uh, first of all, uh, it's worth it's worth thinking about how we got where we are. Why does our electric grid look the way it is? Why does it function the way it does? Um, you know, when 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 this all started, uh, this is using you know 1800s, 19th century technology. As you said, the the plant uh, uh, up on the North Shore here is the hydro plant was built, I think, in 1902 or something. It uses 19th century technology, and that is still what we are using. Uh, to, to light our lights here. Um, if that doesn't concern people just in, in, in its own right, uh, th there are some real design issues that, uh, that haven't been to date, um, but they're going to be more in the future. And, uh, you know, basically the whole idea of, of centralized power generation is starting to fall apart, uh, where you have one big central electric plant or maybe a few big central electric plants and then you have big wires that take those electrons out to people's light bulbs and they use them. Um, and the, there are a couple of issues with that, though. First of all, it, there's so many single points of failure. Every, you know, if, if a line goes down, power goes out. If uh, one generation uh, uh, system goes down, power goes out. If something happens to blow a transmitter uh, 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 any kind of switching equipment, uh, in a neighborhood, the power goes out for that neighborhood. Um, it, it is very difficult and very expensive to expand the capacity 
of, a, of an old system because you have to make our, your central plant bigger and you have to make all the wires bigger along the way. So it's very difficult and it's off, also obviously exposed to weather. Um, and so uh, a different approach, which is being taken now in, uh, in a lot of places uh, around the world that uh, really transforms things and opens the door to a more, uh, a more su sustainable future really is to go to it with a distributed generation model where the, you don't have, you know, the reason we have central plants is because they used to be run with coal or water if it was a hydro plant. And so you can't move uh, coal to everybody's home and burn it for electricity. Although that was Thomas Edison's original idea Thank God we didn't do that. Um, uh, but uh, uh, as, as a result of that, uh, we built great big giant coal plants that are next to coal mines for the most part. Uh, and, um, and now that we've gone solar, it's sort of a muscle memory to build these big giant solar farms and then distribute the electrons. But the, but the fuel is everywhere. So why not just Put the electric generator where you need it, on your home, uh, where you park your car, uh, where energy is used. Um, and it turns out that if you do that, uh, the, the grid, our current grids, which only deliver about, to maybe on the top side, 25% of the power they generate, the rest, up to 90% is locked, uh, not to the line loss, but to uh, all of the energy losses that happen between uh, you know, uh, 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 a fuel and a light bulb in somebody's house. It, that can go. That can actually become ninety percent efficient instead of ten percent efficient. So you uh, you can increase a, the efficiency of the system drastically. Now, why is that so important? Well, it's important because if everybody's uh, running their houses the way they are now, but they also own a couple electric cars they're gonna have two or three times the energy demand on the, on the grid than they do today. And so instead of just building more solar, big solar on the south side and more big transmission lines, if you work with microgrids and you have generation and storage at people's homes, in the neighborhoods, in the communities, you can build a, a tiered system that ends up being about 40% more efficient than the old way of doing things. So that is actually enough to cover all of the additional load that's going to come from EVs. So again, what that means is we don't have to increase the size of our, our current system if we switch to a more flexible uh, bi-directional system. Uh, we can gain the efficiencies to add in all of our electric vehicles and, and not have to increase the size of the system. Uh, it, it also, uh, there's some... So that's a huge deal, right? Because whether you like it or not, um, we're all going to be driving electric cars soon. Uh, those are the only cars that are going to be manufactured, you know, be, certainly well before 2045 when, 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 when Hawaii plans to be 100% renewable. So number one, we gain massive capacity and we can uh, avoid the cost of having to dra dramatically expand our, our central plants and, 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 our, and our transmission grid. Uh, the second thing is weather, and we learned this here certainly in Kauai uh, more than once. Um, and if you look at what's happening in Puerto Rico right now, uh, it's a result of, you know, Hurricane Maria uh, hitting a system that looked a lot like Kauai's system before it got hit. Uh, and so I can't help but think that, you know, if we don't modernize our grid into a smart grid that can work in multiple directions, um, we're kind of one hurricane away from Puerto Rico. Uh, and uh, what's happening there is exactly what I'm describing. People are generating their own electricity um, and they're working with their neighbors to share in microgrids and building the system from the ground up. Not because people are telling them to do it, but because it works and it's very efficient um, and you don't have to pay anybody from the, for the power if you produce it yourself. Uh, so... Uh, so the economics, I think, of doing this for the average uh, home uh, is, is monumental. My wife and I have been, over the last 10 years, we've had three electric vehicles. We've been driving them for over 10 years, 12 years now. We have not spent one penny 
on maintenance, not on one single car, three different makes. We generate all of our own uh, energy, so we, we never have to pay for it. Um, and having uh, solar and batteries at our house uh, with, with uh, two electric cars saves about $1,500 a month in, pay, in costs. So to the average American family, that's about a 50% pay raise off of the $58,000 median uh, income that the average American household makes. So that's what's driving the energy transition. Um, and what you're not going to be able to stop is it takes a lot less money uh, to ru run an electric car in an electric home than if you're burning fuel. Uh, and, and then the, the last thing to talk about maybe is just the impact of severe weather. If you have a centralized system and a line gets knocked out, power's gone. And until that line comes back up, nobody has power. And, and what's happening now is people are realizing that if you have microgrids and you have um, many, many, many sources of distributed power being generated, it can keep the great grid running when the big plants shut down. Uh, recently, just in last year in California, um, it, there was an interesting experience where uh, et, uh, SoCal Edison announced that because of the forest fires in California, they were, they were going to have to shut down two uh, uh, generation plants. And when they did that, the grid power was going to go off and people were uh, given a heads up that they were going to have a blackout. Um, and they shut the, the, the generation plants off and the grid didn't turn off. And the reason is because so many Californians now have power uh, generated at their homes, solar and batteries, that they kept the whole grid running without the central plant. And that's happening. There are stories like that happening in in Florida, where you know the terrible storms that hit Florida last year wiped out most of Central Florida. But there was one town called Babcock, Bab, Babcock Ranch, which people should look into, uh, where they built the infrastructure where it's all solar. Um, it's uh, it's net zero, so it's not they're not uh, importing uh, power. They can they can generate their own power for their lands community. Uh, the houses, the foundations, the drain, drainage was all designed to withstand hurricanes. Um, and when the, uh, when the storm passed uh, in the next morning, uh, not only were all of their houses still standing, essentially undamaged, but the lights never went off and uh, their cars continued to charge. So there's, there are models out there of communities that have really embraced uh, sustainable uh, energy and sustainable water systems, and they've proven to be uh, much, much more efficient. They allow for much greater growth. Uh, they save an enormous amount of money uh, to, the, to the homeowners and the, the consumers, um, and they can withstand uh, uh, storms that a conventional system just can't see can't withstand. So for all of those reasons, um, Hawaii is going to be building smart grids that are resilient and, and uh, 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 flexible in nature. Whether we want to or not, it's going to be a requirement. And if we, do, if we start those plans today, uh, it's going to be a lot less expensive and a lot easier than trying to reinvent uh, our, our delivery system make it a smart grid um, while we're dealing with climate change, while we're dealing with EV uh, acceptance. Uh, and um, it, and it's, it's going to make it not only uh, less expensive, uh, but more, more reliable for the customers. So I'll yeah. stop there, Ricky. That's my pitch for why we should be paying attention to boring things like infrastructure. Um, thank you. Um, I'm going to take off on what you just said, which is systemic and macro, and bring it back down to the individual, the household, the homeowner, uh, who will have to pay for this. And one of the light bulbs, I don't have many, uh, one of the light bulbs just went off listening to you, uh, was the appreciation of cheap energy at the source of the household. It's not just the savings, it's having a plentiful source uh, to do something with. And you and I talked about computer-aided or printing manufacturing. And that's, that, that is the future. 
It's got to be energy intensive. But mm -hmm. if you have a printer at home and you're making something for everybody else. You make some money. Uh, and, and again, what do you make? It's not just the printer. I mean, I'm not just what's one of the most expensive uh, things in the world that that's important to have is aluminum. And of course, it, that's heavily energy in, intensive. So mm -hmm. if you cheapen the in, the resource used most intensively, you get a big boom. And if I'm dad and my kids want to do something like in COVID, my son decided to, to make masks and his wife was in Samoa and she's a great seamstress and I'm going off on a tangent, but their mm -hmm. creative, their creativity uh, got them ahead of the curve. So if the same thing happens in one household and then you have a cul-de-sac and you have six other people, maybe everybody's making the widget A, B, C, D and you end up with something going down the road or maybe you cooperate in other ways. So to me, how do you get people to, to spend that money uh, willingly? It would be self-interest. Well, it, it, yeah, absolutely. And I think this is something that people miss when you when you when you're reading, uh, you know, about how, how we're transitioning from one energy source to the other. And people think, well, whether it's a gas car or an electric car, whether I've got uh, a propane water heater or uh, an electric heat pump water heater, you know, it, it's you know, I'm buying energy from somebody and using it. Uh, but the difference, what's happened that I think is really just dawning on the general population is you're not just going from one energy source to another. You're going from an energy source that I have to buy at a gas station or I have to buy from the propane company to an energy source that I can make myself in my backyard. And, you and, you know, I don't have a... Uh, uh, you know, a, 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 an oil refinery in my backyard, so I can't make gasoline, but I have 32 solar panels so I can make enough uh, electricity to run everything here. Uh, and and that's the difference is it's the self-control that you're, you're right. You're not saying, well, I'm going to pay a little bit less for electricity if it's generated from something else. What it means is right now people are doing business with the electric company uh, the propane company and the gasoline company, and what what will uh, what what's what's happening in the world is a convergence of those into all electric, just essentially getting rid of of fuels um, because they're really really inefficient, and it turns out they're very expensive compared to non fuel options. Oh, and they're bad for the environment too. But I don't believe people are going to just sign up to do solar and batteries and electric cars to save the world. Um, I think they'll do it to save money. So if you can generate your own energy um, and the same type of energy is used for everything in your life, what, no matter, whether it's a phone, a car, a tractor, uh, a piece of yellow iron, um, you know, your stove, it's all run by exactly the same energy then you can imagine this new smart grid that is looks a lot more like the internet today and less like uh, the electric grid. Uh, it's a marketplace where people can put power onto the grid or they can buy power from the grid as needed. And that means that if myself, as you pointed out, and let's say I'm covering most but not all of my power needs here at the house, um, and down my street, all of my neighbors are doing the same thing. Um, we can uh, share uh, excess energy. Let's say, um, you know, two of my neighbors didn't use their car today. Two others went to Lahui and back. You can share energy to recharge those cars in a timely fashion. Um, if it's raining here, but it's not raining in, uh, you know, Kapa'a, then we can share power from Kapa'a to Kilauea. Um, and then if, if need be, you can use, uh, a, you know, sort of a higher level of, uh, of power from grid sources like the big solar farms down south. Um, but the grid and the big solar farms become backup to everybody instead of the primary source of, of electricity. And, um, and so if I am able to, you know, put the, pay for the solar panels and pay for uh, the batteries to go on, 
uh, with the tax credits that are available in uh, in Hawaii, uh, it uh, it's we saved um, an enormous amount. Almost half of the cost of the system uh, was covered by incentive programs, um, and the rest of it paid for itself in just a few years. So think about it: the cost of my my electric you know electric bill goes from you know, 250 bucks or something like that a month. My propane bill goes from 200, 250 bucks a, a month to zero. Uh, my gasoline bill goes to zero. All of my car maintenance with an EV goes to zero because I don't have a fuel system. I don't have a cooling system. I don't have an ignition system. I don't have a transmission. All those things that can go wrong, uh, I don't even have. So I save uh, a, about 250 bucks on gas every month. And I save another couple hundred bucks on maintenance and insurance because these cars are safer. Um, and so, again, what's going to drive this to happen is that the average American family is going to save with two electric cars. You know, a, a system might cost, you know, 20 grand to put in, but it'll save them almost that much money each year. Uh, and as there are more incentive programs and more uh, financial aid available for lower income communities and lower income uh, uh, households, uh, I think. I think that again, people are going to need this in order to make their family budget work uh, as we move forward. And so, at um, this and point, you're not going to stop them. Okay. At this point, I do get to interrupt you with 30 seconds left, and probably less, because one of the things that uh, I'd like to get in, we talked about um, affordable housing is a big issue today. But you know what this brings up is sustainable living. And that yeah. is why land and politics is kind of dovetails to the whole thing, uh, as That's well right. as how you make production of housing cheaper, how you make our transportation, rail, all of those things um, have a have a relationship. And, and to see a better future, the wider the vision, the better. And that, well put. Uh, yeah. OK, so. Thank you very much for showing up. Uh, I know it was a long drive from Kilauea to Kapa'a. And um, <laughs> I'll tell you what, I'll meet you halfway at Oasis and we'll have a drink. How's that? It sounds good, Ricky. Always a pleasure to talk to you. Thanks a lot. Take care. Thanks, Rick. Cheers. Aloha. Cheers. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.